the American Cemetery at Normandy, the final resting place for 9,387 men, men who traveled across an ocean to beat back the Germans, liberate the French, and sacrifice themselves for the good of the free world. It's one of the most moving places in the world and one of the most visited spots in Normandy. So he went back to America from his life, from his Western recuperation. Right. Right. On this day, several tour guides compared notes on one of the most visited grave sites, that of Robert and Preston Nyland of Tonawanda. It was the Nyland story that inspired the Steven Spielberg film Saving Private Ryan, a film that in turn inspired a lot of talk between generations. The film Saving Private Ryan, when it came out, definitely uh, excited uh, a greater interest and understanding. We had four members of our family actually involved in the uh, Normandy invasion. St. Mary and Glace is where Bobby landed. Pete Nyland's uncles were the ones portrayed in the 1998 film with his uncle Fritz, Sergeant Frederick Nyland, the model for Private Ryan. He remembers visiting the graves as a young man decades before the movie. My dad had asked us to stop there and put flowers on his brother's graves, and I said, sure. At the time, it was just another stop on his trip to Europe. He hadn't yet developed an appreciation of the magnitude of their sacrifice. It was the movie being made that pushed him and his wife Jan on a path of discovery into their own family history, beginning with a trunk that had been passed down from his aunts. But it was, it was in our basement, and we had never even opened it. Right. So once they said that there was a movie being made, we started going through all these papers. That trunk was filled with newspaper clippings, headlines of heartbreak, a collection they shared with Spielberg on a visit to Hollywood. He was looking at the scrapbook, and uh, he said at the end of it, he said, and by the way, show them my private office and fly them all back for the premiere. But one of the most profound pieces they found was a letter from overseas. It's just a very sad letter written mostly to, you know, it starts out, Dearest Mother. Mother. I miss you a terrible lot, and I love you dearly and deeply. When I do come back to stay, I promise you that I will be a better man. It was just unbelievable. We're all coming home, don't worry. It was from Bobby, uh, Uncle Bob. And it was, we had the letter, it was, it was crazy. The heartbreak was that Bobby, along with Preston, whose friends, by the way, called him Pete, and who Pete is named after, never came home. In the movie, it told the story of three brothers being killed in Normandy and the efforts to find the surviving sibling and return him home. The real story was somewhat different. On May 16, 1944, Edward Nyland, Pete's father, was shot down over Burma and presumed dead. He actually was taken captive and spent a year in a Japanese prison camp. June 6, D-Day, Bobby was killed. The following day, Preston died. And back home in Tonawanda, the news did not come all at once. It came in the form of Western Union telegrams. They used to deliver my bicycle. Oh, and, yeah. and they didn't, like in the movie Private Ryan, they yeah. sent an attache yeah. out. But they didn't have time to do that. There was too many, too people many died. people. A heart-wrenching series of telegrams. No one wanted to go over to the house to, yeah. to break the news. How do you do that? Sent over the course of several days and carried by a delivery boy who pleaded with his boss not to send him again. It was, you know, it's Tanawanda, it's small. He's like, I can't go back to that house. Just one bit of the story that they came to know in the wake of the film. What that movie meant to us, I think, and to a lot of people of the generation after the greatest generation, is it started, it started a conversation. Bridget Nyland's father, Joe, was Robert and Preston's cousin. When my father started talking about his war experiences and what a lot of us kind of describe as a little bit of survivor's guilt, he lost, you know, he lost two cousins that were his childhood friends. But Pete went looking for the details of what actually happened amid the chaos of D-Day, how his uncles died heroically. Bobby's unit received orders to pull back from this spot at Nouvelle Au Plaine. But when the medic refused to leave so he could attend to and hide wounded soldiers, Bobby looked at him and told him, if you're staying, I'm staying. Bobby sacrificed himself to save others. Preston was killed by a sniper near the Crisbeck Battery, which is close to Utah Beach. As the family story goes, he was shot going after a wounded soldier. One particularly emotional detail Pete learned was how his uncle Fritz actually found out his brothers died. With the help of his company's chaplain, Father Francis Sampson, who took him to a temporary cemetery in this field in Blossville. He asked Father Sampson, um, I'm here to, I heard my brother Robert was killed in action. Robert was with the 82nd Airborne. And um, Father Sampson was looking through the, um, you know, through the ledgers and stuff, and he said, 
Um, oh, good. We don't have any Robert here. We only have a Preston. He said, well, that's my brother, too. Robert was actually buried in another temporary cemetery in nearby St. Mary Glees, all sites that Pete and Jen had to see for themselves, along with their permanent resting spot. We were on Omaha Beach. We were on Utah Beach. We were actually crawling in bunkers. We had an, an agenda when we went to, yeah. to Normandy this time. Yeah. I mean, we wanted to actually stand on the spots where, where they were killed. Um, we wanted to feel their presence in the countryside where they were. Um, we did all of that. And then when we, we culminated, finished the trip at the cemetery. And that, I think, was the part that I was dreading the most, is going to the cemetery because it was so emotional. Emotional, not only because of the Nylons buried here, but because of the thousands of other soldiers just like them. And it was quiet, it was serene, it was eerie, because you felt the presence all those, yeah. of all those boys there. When you see a guy like Pete Nyland come through, and he's just in the last 10 years learned about everything in his family, uh, what impact does that have to have on you personally? That's a profound impact. Every, every time that you deal with someone out here that, that, that can recall memories of their families and everything else, that bonding that they come back here to, it's absolutely, you, you, can't, you can't be human and, and not realize what, what happened here. These people gave up everything. They gave up their families, they did everything. A grand gesture that 70 years later still evokes gratitude, pride, and tears. June 9, 1944, a day that changed the world. For members of the 82nd Airborne's 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, it was also a day they were dropped into the eye of a storm. Among their first priorities was trying to secure this bridge at Lafayette. Okay. Because it was crucial here to be able to take this causeway on the Merdere River, plus the one in uh, Chef Dupont also, because they were the only way for the troops that were landing in uh, Utah Beach. I was pinned down in a wheat field, and I kept crawling, crawling, and I crawled out of the wheat field, but my pack was full of holes with it. One of those men was Clinton Riddle, who made his first trip back to Normandy last year to the spot where he and his unit were caught in an ambush and would have been sitting ducks had it not been for the sacrifice of a Western New Yorker named Charles de Glopper. Frankly, I think it's a miracle. They had gotten slightly off course and strayed between the farm fields that are separated by high mounds and thick hedges. The soldiers came around a corner and right into the crossfire of German snipers. You can see how dense the hedgerows are. So when the gunfire started coming from this direction and that direction, Charles de Glopper knew his platoon was in trouble. So that's when he made his stand. He jumped out into the middle of the road with his heavy rifle and started firing at the Nazis. He took all the attention and the gunfire upon himself as his platoon was able to escape around that hedgerow. Well, we run into three guys that were in the company, right. and they said, if it wasn't for Charlie, we wouldn't be here today. Ray DeGlopper is Charlie's nephew, who still lives in Grand Island, just down the road from where Charlie grew up. He was just a boy when his uncle was killed, and his grieving grandfather received the Medal of Honor on Charlie's behalf. A tearjerker. I mean, it's kind of... It brings tears to my eyes. I... But it is also a tear-jerking story of which Ray spent a lifetime learning the details. Family really never talked a lot about it. Uh, like most I, families I and veterans from that greatest generation. I learned more through Joe Senekowski than he did anywhere else. Joe Senekowski is the guy sitting right across the table, a member of Grand Island's VFW Post 9249. That seems like that's where... You, you got more involved, you got you asked more questions then. Joe, Joe uh, was telling stuff that you, I didn't never knew before. And this was when you were an adult, correct? Obviously. This was 1994. <laughs> Incredible, but it took 50 years before they started learning the details of what happened in those farm fields of Normandy. What makes somebody get up and just do this? I mean, you, the adrenaline's got to be really flowing. Charlie's a hero to the 82nd. And that's why Joe Senekowski wanted to make sure his heroics were known at home as well. I said, gee, this guy is almost forgotten. 
even though a street at Fort Bragg was named after him, his portrait hangs in the Hall of Heroes on base, and a U.S. Army transport ship was renamed the Private Charles de Glopper. The story of his sacrifice is not very well known here in western New York. So Sinikowski has done what he can to help people remember, including organizing the rededication of the Memorial Park on Grand Island in Charlie's honor. It was a good thing to uh, expose the history of Somebody did something from Grand Island. Yeah. Most of the people n didn't know anything about it. That understanding and appreciation rose to an entirely new level about five years ago. When the Degloppers first went over in 2010, my French friends, especially the ones in the association, they literally wanted to shake their hands and, and touch them and say, thank you. They got a chance to see how much Uncle Charlie's sacrifice still means to the people of Normandy people who put up this monument not far from where Charlie fell. And this plaque at the chapel at Coquigny, a chapel that was nearly destroyed during the battle. It's been rebuilt with a stained glass window honoring those airborne liberators, overlooking the churchyard that is still scarred from war, chipped tombstones and bullets still embedded in the wrought iron. Charles de Glopper even has his own exhibit in the Airborne Museum at St. Maraglis. This? The United States Army scrapbook was presented to us by the de Gopper family when they came to visit for the very, very first time in Normandy. Viv Roger is an American expatriate who now lives in Lafayette, France, and is part of the U.S. Association Normandy, a group dedicated to honoring the service and sacrifice of the American soldiers. It is a recognition of what we're trying to do to keep the memory alive. Ed Viv's first project with the group was the Charles de Glopper Memorial. They're not the only ones, though, making sure those heroes are remembered. In February, Fort Bragg bestowed another honor on Charles de Glopper, renaming their air assault school after him. We need to be thankful. We need to pass it on to other generations. It needs to live on even past our years. In the spring of 1944, Monsieur Louis Marion was 17 years old. And he still remembers playing practical jokes on the Germans who had occupied his small hamlet of Gatville for the better part of his and youth. Since this guy he was putting lines where he could dry his socks, so he, he stole the socks and he stored them in these big nettle patches so the guy, he would have to get very itchy to pick it back. It's like poison ivy a little bit. But he also remembers vividly the early morning hours of June 6th. I mean, there were waves of uh, C-47 that were passing on. He was lying in his bed in this farmhouse and heard something hit the roof. He touched the roof and then he landed uh, in the garden on the side. At daybreak, he realized it was U.S. paratroopers, the first indication to him and others in this rural region of Normandy that the Americans were part of the invasion force. They were kind of afraid of it because they knew that now they have these Germans in the back, in the lower part of the hamlet, and er, them at the higher part, they would be having the American that would be at the junction. And one of those paratroopers was a man of God, Captain and Father Ignatius Maternowski. He was probably the only chaplain at that time who was a paratrooper because he wanted to be with his men. Father Maternowski was a member of the first graduating class here at St. Francis High School in Hamburg. So from the moment he touched soil in Normandy, his Franciscan theology kicked in, concentrating on helping people more than fighting people. It became clear what he had to do when a glider full of U.S. soldiers crash-landed in this field, leaving most of them injured. The medics, they all take them and they put them as, and took refuge in the, in the little uh, country shop that was... Uh, at this place in the Goodville Hamlet. A country shop about the size of the house that stands there today. A shop that was being used as a hospital for not only soldiers, but also villagers caught in the crossfire. And knowing the space was not adequate, Father Maternowski took it upon himself to try and do something about it. Father Maternowski went up and used the, the pass to, all the way up to, to meet with the German at the, very, uh, at the very upper part of the village. He crossed enemy lines to discuss using a house at the end of the village to uh, take care of wounded soldiers on both sides 
of the lines. Father Matronowski walked up the road to this building, which was being used as an infirmary and a headquarters at the time for the Germans. I'm told he knocked on that door to speak to the officer in charge. So the German uh, doctor uh, came back with him, using the, the way back to check the information that he gave him that yes, there were some undead. The German doctor also noticed that there were military supplies from the glider and ammunition. And Father Ignatius walked the Nazi back through the hamlet to assure his safe return. The well-intentioned priest got about 100 yards in returning to the country store. And that was at this moment that Father Matinovsky got shot in the back. When the bullet from a German sniper dropped him in his tracks. It was the first dead people that he ever saw from of his life. Seventy years later, that image is still etched in Monsieur Marion's memory. As he took us to the very spot where Father Matanowski fell and laid lifeless for several days until it was safe enough for American troops to come and recover the body. He said he was uh, laying here stretched out and his head was into the ditch and from someone he had talked to they had seen the Germans kick the body so they kind of rolled into the ditch. Some believe that Matanowski's execution was ordered after the German doctors saw what was inside the store. And the events that followed certainly support that theory. That's when uh, in the afternoon uh, they give the order to the tanks to go down and they will be shelling uh, the country shop where all the wounded that were in there and uh, all the occupants that were there. They blew up the shop, killing everyone inside. And all these years later, Father Metternowski's sacrifice is not forgotten, neither here in Gatville nor in his alma mater, where the award for the school's top athlete bears his name. Using Father Ignatius' story has been a great help because the present students now have a sense of history, they have a sense of heroic action, and they know why this particular man did what he did. Now, thanks in part to his St. Francis teacher, a movement is underway to have his heroics honored to an even greater extent. Father Metronowski I didn't know about until I signed up to work here as a French teacher at St. Francis High School. Kelly Carrick is a retired lieutenant colonel with the 82nd Airborne. Her final tour of duty had her in Paris, serving as a liaison and the commander of the VFW there. During that time, she interacted with countless veterans groups, but it wasn't until she came home to Western New York that she heard anything about Father Matanowski. I literally signed my contract in June of 2010, and I was taking veterans over to Normandy for commemorations for D-Day a week later, and I saw the plaque to Father Matanowski, and within minutes I was calling my friends in Normandy and said, you're not going to believe this. There's another connection from Buffalo back to Normandy. Kerrig is now working with Father James McCurry, who heads up the Franciscans Our Lady of Angels province, which covers a large area stretching from England and Ireland all the way to the U.S. and south to Brazil. And they hope to convince leaders in Washington that Father Maternowski's actions and sacrifice are worthy of the Medal of Honor. So once we got the testimony from Normandy and the survivors uh, in recent years that the date was actually D-Day, June 6th that he died, the only U.S. military chaplain killed on D-Day itself. Father McCurry says that stories like that of Monsieur Marion help in their efforts to piece the story together and to bring it to life. That gives him a singularity that uh, other casualties on that day, D-Day, don't have. And it's uh, on the basis of uh, that unique status as the only chaplain and on the basis of the testimonies of, from the surviving villagers that we would petition the military uh, to consider giving him a higher honor. It's so overdue, and his story is about peace. You know, a chaplain doesn't carry a weapon. He was trying to take care of wounded soldiers, not just Americans, but Germans. How do you put that into words? Whether or not a Medal of Honor is in store, this is a story of faith above all. As Father Ignatius Metternowski was able to keep his sights set on his ministry of service to others, even while being dropped into the hell of war.
Films are often inspired by real life events, but they can also inspire some real life response. It's huge to, to have all these and everything passed through here from Utah or Omaha. Daniel Briard is the president of the association U.S. Normandy, the French group that has made it their mission to remember the sacrifices of the American liberators during the D-Day invasion. They raise money and commission monuments and memory boards, like this one near Lafayette, France, to Grand Island native Charles de Glopper, who gave his life to save members of his platoon. He went out from the, on the pathway and he opened fire on, on the German. <laughs> Briard was originally moved to action after seeing the 1962 film, The Longest Day. Locations on the silver screen that remain today. The bunkers, craters, and batteries at Point de Hoc look the same as they did in the film. And more importantly, the way they did when the Army Rangers scaled these cliffs to face the enemy. The lines between history and cinema blur because of the emotions that remain decades later. We also saw that in the case of Saving Private Ryan. When the movie opened, the big story revolved around its realism. So real, in fact, that many veterans experienced a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. But the overriding response has been much more positive. We often talk here in Normandy about the Spielberg effect uh, because uh, the, um, the film Saving Private Ryan, when it came out, definitely uh, excited uh, a greater interest and understanding about what these men achieved and the sacrifice that they made. The film got veterans to open up about their experiences in World War II. Veterans like Bridget Nyland's father, Joe. You know, so much that they had to endure during what we now kind of seem as our rite of passage years of 18 to 25, those young men and women didn't get those years. They were, and yet they came back to really be the building block. And I think that's what the movie totally uncorked for me. is. It also uncorked an entire chapter of her family's history. The film was based on Joe's cousins, Robert, Preston, and Frederick, or Fritz Nyland of Tonawanda. It made the Nyland family want to know more about what their uncles went through. It also drove many from all over to visit the U.S. Cemetery at Normandy, and in particular, the graves of Robert and Preston Nyland. This site is the second most visited in the entire cemetery, behind only that of the Roosevelt brothers. For many, the film served as inspiration and an introduction to history. It still is a place that moves me. Uh, so when people are coming here for the first time, the impact is, is considerable. But Saving Private Ryan is not the only example of art imitating life and driving a passion for discovery. It is also not the only example of Western New Yorkers playing a part. The book, an HBO series, Band of Brothers, tells the story of Easy Company, the 506th Regiment of the 101st Airborne, a unit that played a big role in the invasion of Normandy. One of the main characters is Skip Muck. Muck grew up in Tatawanda and was actually a friend of the Nyland brothers. The series tracks them from D-Day, and while this may be a product of Hollywood, the locations and events are real. Locations like Braycourt Manor in St. Marie du Mont, a plaque stands today commemorating the actual battle here. And like Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers has driven many people to visit these locations. Like Scott Kennedy of Toronto, who I ran across at the nearby monument to Easy Company Commander Richard Winters. I'm a big fan of the series Band of Brothers and uh, Major Winners, so I thought I would come and uh, see this as part of my tour. We were at Juno Beach earlier, paying tribute to the Canadians. And while Hollywood may move these people to remember the past, the sights and spirit of Normandy moves people in an entirely different way. It was emotionally, it's been very overwhelming. Yeah, it definitely choked me up and brought a few tears to my eyes standing on Juno Beach. Tears are still shed today over the blood that was shed to free these lands, liberate these people, and pave the way for victory in Europe 70 years ago.